Voices of Fitness and Bodybuilding wants to welcome you to Episode 8. We're about to begin our reading service for you as soon as we get clearance from the webmaster. We know you have many choices of podcasts out there, and we're happy you picked VOF&B to be your bodybuilding article audio magazine. So, fasten your seatbelt, lean back and relax. Let us do the reading for you. This week, in the fitness category, you are injured but still want to burn calories. Is it even possible? Markham Hyde from Time.com tells us how. The bodybuilding article is for the ladies this week and examines the dangers and myths surrounding waist trainers. That hourglass figure is actually a ticking time bomb of death. Okay, maybe not death, but it's not good for you and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Then we get Dave Polsonella to weigh in on a variety of topics as we get to even more questions that you, the listeners, have submitted in part three of our Q&A. And the off-topic article is for all you dog owners out there. That look your pet is giving you after it does something wrong? Is it guilt or something else? It happens to all of us at one time or another. You're making such great progress in the gym. You're losing weight, getting ready for summer. You're getting more and more enthusiastic about your training. Maybe a little too enthusiastic. You're digging into an exercise and then, boink, something pulls or tweaks and you're out of commission for a little while. Or maybe the injury is really bad and you're sidelined for a longer while. It's incredibly frustrating But is there anything you can do to keep the progress going, or at least not fall too far back? Markham Hyde, writing in the health and fitness section of Time.com, has this advice. This is from the You Asked section in Exercise and Fitness, and it's called How Do I Burn Calories with an Injury? Posted December 7th, 2016. A body in motion likes to stay in motion. For athletes, being sidelined from sports can trigger anxiety, depression, and even suicidal thoughts, according to a review study from Princeton University. But whether you're an elite athlete or not, sooner or later we must all cope with injury. When it comes to the question of how to stay active while injured, the answer has numerous caveats that are specific to the injury, says James Onate. Associate Professor of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at Ohio State University. Onati says rowing machines or ergometers, the exercise machine that looks like a set of bike pedals for your hands, are great workouts for people with lower body injuries. For upper body issues, recumbent bikes and water-supported running, which eases stress on the joints, can give you that endorphin rush you're looking for, he says. But for people with back or abdominal injuries, or for those recovering from many surgeries, nearly all forms of vigorous or dynamic exercise may be off limits. What then? Try non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT, NEAT, as it's called by the experts who study it. NEAT refers to all of our spontaneous daily movements that aren't dictated by sports or work. Everything from getting up out of a chair to fidgeting, says Dr. Michael Jensen, a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic. Jensen's research has shown that these neat movements vary significantly from person to person and may help explain why two people who eat similar diets and participate in the same exercise activities gain or lose weight at significantly different rates. Quote, it's not a coincidence that people who seem fidgety or who can't sit still tend to be skinny, he says. What we've found is that all movement adds up to something meaningful, end quote. Some studies have concluded that regular physical activity can't offset the heart disease or cancer risks that result from long periods of sitting still. But neat movements can break up those long sedentary periods and lower the associated health risks, says Dr. Pedro Villablanca, a cardiologist with New York's Montefiore Medical Center. 
Villablanca's research has shown that neat movements alone may add up to a whopping 2,000 burned calories per day, on top of the energy your body naturally burns just to keep you alive. Quote, what we've learned is that all movement is beneficial, Villablanca says. Walking, standing, stretching, fidgeting, it all adds up. Even chewing gum burns around 15 calories per hour, he says. The takeaway here isn't that traditional exercise activities like walking or swimming aren't great for you. They are. But if an injury makes vigorous exercise impossible, filling your day with small movements, twisting in your chair, sitting up straight, stretching, can help you burn calories and maintain your physical fitness. Of course, NEAT's powers have their limits. If you're a marathon runner, some extra movements aren't going to let you maintain the fitness level you'd achieved before that sprain sidelined you, Jensen says. But don't assume that because you can't run or lift weights that you can't burn calories. Quote, even if you're injured, little movements matter, Villablanca says. Like the article says, for those of us who are very active, NEAT doesn't sound like it will do much compared to what we're used to. I mean, I do 45 minutes of cardio or weight training almost every day, and twisting in my chair isn't going to replace that. But in general, I do try to incorporate neat movements into my daily life all the time. I mean, I take the stairs when I can, and I, I don't fight to park close to the supermarket, stuff like that. Whether or not it actually adds up to something that is body transformative, I have no idea. But I do know that video editing is extremely sedentary, as is podcasting, by the way. And I get antsy after a while, and I have to move and sweat. And since keeping the body moving is the key to good health, I guess every little bit helps. Waist trainers. They used to call them corsets back in the olden days, and somehow they've been making a comeback, possibly encouraged by one or more Kardashians. I've heard a lot of bikini and figure competitors are using them these days, but do they work? Are they harmful? The ever-controversial and outspoken John Romano at TNation.com has this to say. The truth about waist trainers. Squeams, the unhealthiest, Fitness Fad by John Romano, posted January 25th, 2017 on tnation.com. There is a growing obsession with turning a woman's body into a caricature, huge behind, huge boobs, and a waist that's excruciatingly small. Though it's far more prevalent in Latin countries, the look is catching on in the U.S., promoted on social media by celebrities like the Kardashians and Nicki Minaj. This twisted exaggeration of femininity has even begun to infiltrate the fitness industry. On these women, the ones who promote health and fitness, their waists are artificially squeezed in to the degree that it looks cartoonish. My problem isn't with small waists in general, but the ones that have been deformed to become that way. The culprit in this case is not some radical fad diet or dangerous exercise. No it's actually worse. Women with these unnaturally pinched waists are getting the look with a device called a waist trainer. And it's nothing new. Waist training is just the updated, healthy-sounding term for an archaic strategy that goes back centuries. Only then they were called corsets. Today, most women refer to them as squeams, waist cinchers, or waist trainers, which is odd since nothing is being trained when your fat is merely getting pushed up toward your armpits and down below the belt. If you grab a tube of toothpaste in the middle and keep the lid on, the toothpaste won't actually leave the tube. It will just get squished elsewhere. Corsets can be traced way back. Old advertisements used to promise that you could tame your midsection and even increase your health by wearing the thing continuously. But today, even with limited use, doctors warn that waist trainers can cause serious long-term damage. Scientifically, the claims made by waist trainer manufacturers about shrinking the size of your waist are ridiculous. The only difference between an old-school corset and a waist trainer is that the corsets were stiff, had bone or metal supports, and were laced up. 
A waist trainer closes with little hooks and is made of elastic that squishes you in, giving you the same result, or an even more pronounced one, when you graduate to increasingly smaller sizes, as some competition coaches often recommend. And while that result might look desirable, it's at best ineffective for fat loss and at worst dangerous. Though they're more popular in Latin countries, many in the U.S., particularly the bikini and figure competitors, are relying on them just as much as they are on diet plans and cardio. Now, since I live in Mexico and own a rather large gym in a big city, I'm able to tell you, without exaggerating, that at least 90% of my female members wear a waist trainer every single day. The women wearing them are either ignorant about the repercussions or they're in denial that anything bad could ever happen to them. Here are the myths they believe. Myth number one, waist trainers make you lose weight. If you hacked off your arm, the scale would indicate that you've lost weight. But the weight we all need to lose should be from fat. So do waist trainers help you lose body fat? No. Yet, Nakeitha Thomas, owner and founder of Waist Gang Society, whose products Kim Kardashian has endorsed, says, quote, perspiration while wearing the waist trainer creates the equivalent of a 30 to 40 minute workout for the user, end quote. On one company's website, a section titled Health Tips says, quote, waist training is a gradual process of waist reduction using our corset, end quote. The only thing wrong with those statements is that they're not true. If you lose any weight while wearing a waist trainer, it's likely you're losing water weight from sweating. If you lose any weight while wearing a waist trainer, it's likely you're losing water weight from sweating. Rehydrate and it'll all come back. Myth 2. Waist trainers make you eat less. Some contend that because a waist trainer applies pressure to your abdominal area, that you'll eat a little less because your stomach is being squished. But that doesn't necessarily mean you'll stay in a caloric deficit. When you take the thing off, your appetite may make you overcompensate for the calories you missed earlier. A study published in the Scandinavian Journal of Primary Healthcare sought to prove whether waist trainers could be used to maintain weight lost after participants followed a low-calorie diet. Study subjects were instructed to wear a waist trainer for at least five hours a day, five days a week, for nine months. Unfortunately, most study subjects found the waist trainer to be too uncomfortable to comply with the study guidelines, leaving the researchers to conclude that regardless of whether the waist trainer would have been effective or not, quote, corset treatment doesn't appear to be an option for sustained weight control, end quote. Myth 3. Waist trainers are harmless. First, they can contribute to dehydration, which probably doesn't sound serious to you, but sweating profusely from the midsection while only being able to take small sips of water is not the pinnacle of health. Nor is the bacterial infection that can happen as a result of the sweat trapped against your skin for long periods of time below that waist trainer. Rashes are common. They also cause acid reflux because of the pressure on the abdomen, which pushes stomach acid into areas where it shouldn't be. And ironically, while these trainers are intended to make the waist smaller, they can actually decrease core strength and atrophy abdominal muscle. The wearer doesn't have to keep her muscles tight because she's basically wearing a gigantic constricting belt. You can relax your stomach and get sloppy because the belt is doing the work of holding everything in. Myth 4. They train your waist to be a smaller size. If you wrap an ace bandage tightly around your arm and leave it there for an hour, you're going to have an indentation in your soft tissue when you unwrap it. But it's not going to be permanent. An hour later, your arm is going to look normal again. So by the same process, any waist slimming is going to be temporary, unless it's actually deforming the structure of your bones and organs. And when that's the case, the damage caused by a waist trainer could be permanent. Some doctors contend that there could be damage to the spine. The pressure exerted by the trainer affects the bones, ligaments, and nerves with prolonged use. That should make anyone with a brain ask, what the hell kind of training is this anyway? 
the biggest cause for concern is what happens to your organs when they're squashed for prolonged periods of time. Women have also been known to pass out after wearing a waist trainer because they can't get enough air in their lungs. Waist trainers can also place excessive pressure on organs like the bladder, causing women to leak involuntarily. Can't get sexier than that, right? Men don't love pee stains, FYI. Waist trainers can damage the diaphragm, colon, liver, stomach, and intestines, which can all be shifted around inside the body and alter the way you function as a self-sufficient adult who shouldn't need diapers by the age of 25. This is called a visceral displacement, by the way. These bodily structures actually have jobs that keep you alive. When you mess with them, you can make your life a living hell. The negative side effects can be long-term, permanent, or even deadly, and far outweigh their proposed benefits. Why History Left the Corset Behind At the turn of the 20th century, a French doctor, Ludovic O'Followell, published a paper titled Le Corset, exposing the dangers of two tight corsets. While X-ray technology was in its infancy, he was able to show photos of squashed rib cages and displaced organs. The companies that sell waist trainers sometimes say you should be wearing this device for 10 hours a day, but the fine print says users need to eat healthy and exercise to actually see results. You think? Mercedes Carlita de la Vega, the name was altered for her privacy, was a sultry Mexican figure competitor. She was plumped up, pumped up, pushed out, and augmented in every way. She desperately wanted to strut her sizzling stuff on the Mexican national bodybuilding stage in the figure division, but she had an insatiable appetite for sopes, fried yucca, and churros dipped in cajeta. So she approached a competition judge who advised her to wear a faja, which literally means belt or wrap. Mercedes cinched herself up during her next workout and set out to train her waist. Then she kept herself squeezed into that thing for the rest of the day. Then she bought more of them, one tighter than the next. Eventually, she wore a waist trainer 12 to 15 hours a day. She took selfies in them from all different angles, accentuating her squished waist and became a local social media sensation. With enough girls asking her about her faja and her dwindling waist, Mercedes actually became a distributor for one of the largest waist trainer manufacturers in Colombia and began selling them to girls at the gym. She got so busy with women wanting a smaller midsection that she opened a small boutique, selling the full line of Colombian waist trainers, Spanx, and traditional corsets. All was well and good for several weeks. The weeks turned into months, and Mercedes squished herself into tighter and tighter waist trainers. Soon, as she was starting her prep for the Mexican Nationals, the problem started. One day, her back started hurting. Even though her waist trainer was elastic, she had a very hard time bending over, so most of the exercises she did that required any bend of the waist had become impossible. Of course, taking off her trainer to do them, to her, was out of the question. As her contest grew near, her problems grew worse. Her back pain became excruciating. Her lower ribs were getting pulled in, putting pressure on her vertebra. Indigestion and heartburn became a daily occurrence from the waist trainer exerting so much pressure and pushing stomach acid up out of the stomach, making it hard for her to eat. She also had a hard time breathing for the pressure on her diaphragm and would become dangerously lightheaded during her cardio sessions. One day, she passed out on the treadmill, fell, and took a nice chunk of skin off her knee. But in her mind, these discomforts were a small price to pay for a thinning waist, which only seemed to be thinner while she wore her waist trainer. As soon as she took it off, her belly poked out, probably because her abs had atrophied from not being able to train them. As the contest grew closer, Mercedes took off her waist trainer even less. She even slept in it. Nothing could keep her from dwindling her waist enough to win the Mexican Nationals. Problem was, she was pretty much losing muscle everywhere, especially her core, and the lines of her physique were becoming blurred. But she didn't see any of that, because she was totally fixated on her waist. 
As many women do during a contest diet, Mercedes became constipated. But Mercedes endured the discomfort, focusing only on her contest. On the sixth day of not having a bowel movement, she woke up with a scorching abdominal pain. She felt nauseous and started vomiting and running a high fever. Now she was scared. She finally gave in and removed her waist trainer. Almost instantly, a shooting pain ran up and down her spine. Her stomach distended, and a pain set in so bad that she passed out. Her roommate found her unconscious on the floor and rushed her to the hospital where the emergency room physician diagnosed a bowel obstruction that had caused her small intestine to burst, requiring emergency surgery. So much for the Nationals. Mercedes had a long road to recovery. Her back pain had become chronic and she experienced some peripheral nerve damage in her legs from sitting while compressed in her waist trainer. She also found a few varicose veins that weren't there before. It took her several months to fully recover, not only from her surgery and her back pain, but also from the organ compression. And after all that, when Mercedes was fully recovered, guess how many inches her waist had shrunk? Zero. Squeam users can literally bend or break their lower ribs and rearrange their organs. Where do you think all that stuff goes when you squeeze it so tight? Sure. If you're a young woman interested in fitness, you likely know women who've been using a waist trainer without repercussion so far. That's probably true. Temporarily wearing one that's not too tight may not result in such devastating problems. But one thing is still true. You're not going to train your waist to do crap using a waist trainer. The only way you're going to get it leaner is through your diet, exercise, heavy lifting, and patience. The mentality that would make a woman use a waist trainer is cause for alarm. Taken to extremes, this can be likened to an eating disorder or tanorexia. If you insist on using one, maybe don't try to graduate to tighter and tighter versions. Use one that's not so tight that it causes breathing and circulation problems and wear it sparingly. And also, try to remember, they don't work. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't wait for hoop skirts and 100 button boots to make a comeback too. <laughs> and, he, and here to comment on waist trainers is my brother Dave, the star of our documentary Raising the Bar, and my brother. My opinion on them have ch has changed over the years. I used to think it was nonsense, but they actually do make your waist smaller. But here's the caveat. It's it's like the the Chinese girls who bind their feet yeah they don't just put on a small shoe on tuesday they wear those shoes all of the time day and night the girls that i have seen who have actually trained their waists smaller never don't have their waist trainers on well if you're going to make the chinese foot binding analogy then they should start wearing the waist trainers when they're five years old Right. Well, they couldn't so do they that. Grow, they grow. They grow disproportionately, and they distort their bodies with these things. And there are women who have done that, but n not my competitors. But um, there are. I've personally witnessed some some crazy shit with those waist trainers. But the girl, I don't know what kind of consequences. You know, I mean, they're bound up really, really tight all the time, and their organs are getting misplaced and squeezed around and pushed but when down. You're train but when you're training someone and they say, should I use a weight tr uh, waist trainer, what do you say? That has never happened to me. No one's asked me if they should use a waist trainer yet. Okay. They either they just either wear them, uh, it's something they do, and it's something they've done, and it's something I must accept, um, <clears throat> or they don't. No one's ever said, like, should I wear a waist trainer? Not yet, but if they do, I'll say, sure, why not? If you if you can commit to the thing. And the thing is that you have to commit all the time to wear it. It's not right. a part gig. Okay. Uh, so anyway, we are going to continue with our Q&A. Uh, this is part three of the Q&A. We're rolling over from the last episode. And we've got a bunch more questions. Hopefully we can bang these out in the 25 minutes or so that we have for this segment. 
Uh, first one comes from Peter Grant. My question is for Dave. Quote, unquote, spring break 87. What's your favorite <laughs> recreational drug and or drugs to do? He's, he's going back a little too far with the 87. I think he, I think he is. I wasn't really in that scene at all. At 87, I, you know where I was in 87? I was living in Jersey with Crazy Linda. <laughs> I was isolated from humanity in this little flea bitten apartment for a year. That's that's where I was then. So there was no social life. There was that was like a dismal time for me. So if you're looking at when I started to get into real pa- actual partying and stuff like that, and there was never any spring break involved. I never went to a spring you break. You made your own spring break wherever yeah. you were. I didn't need to go to a spring break. Um, but you know, when I started getting into partying, I, I never really did. And to this day, I've never done a lot of recreational drugs. Um, I've been around some people at certain times who are into that and maybe dabbled here and there, but I never wanted to get caught up in that roller coaster. So there was no drug of choice. I've tried ecstasy. I I liked it. Um, what was that like? I've never tried that. Oh, it's really amazing, dude. Everything's just wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's just pure. It, it's it's what it's called. It's what it's called, <laughs> you know. Well, I've uh, seen you. I've witnessed you uh, using Ambien as a recreational drug. In that, you just try to stay awake and see what happens. And I've gotten the crazy, insane texts yeah. from you that just get more and more incomprehensible until they stop. <laughs> Was what happens is your brain starts to short circuit. And uh, it's really cool, like, like to wake up the next morning and I look at the text that I sent you and I'm like, what in the fuck am I trying to say? <laughs> what is this? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> it's funny, um, though. It's dangerous, though. You know, you got to be really careful. But you're more of like a white wine guy than anything else. Yeah, I mean, I've done Vicodin. I've done, um, like I said, Ecstasy. I've done, I've never done GHB. I was too, I was too afraid of that. But I, that was huge in the 90s. G, everyone was taking GHB. Um, what else? Um, oh, that time at the Arnold really made me uh, take too much. Um, it was Oxy, I think. Either Percocets or Oxycontin, and I was in bed for the entire, entire trip. I spent sick in the bed. Oh, that's not I, fun. I, I missed the entire weekend. Oh, I remember when we were... In that spring break mode, my, my friends and I, not you and I, my friends and I, we went to Wildwood of all places. We were going to spend a week there. Mm-hmm. And one of my friends decided, I'm going to stay drunk for the entire week. Oh, my God. And he started one more, the first morning, drank the hell all day, was wrecked by the nighttime, started again the next morning, and was out of commission by halfway through that second day. And then lost another two or three days because he was just so sick. You can't do that. You can't. Unless you're Timmy. Timmy can do that. Yeah, well, his body chemistry is different. He spent his entire lifetime building his system up to accept that. This kid was a lightweight. He had no idea what he was getting himself into. (laughs) I know. Weekend alcoholic. What was that? He was dabbling in alcoholism. Goal. That's like your goal. I think he thought that if a little bit of booze and a little bit of being drunk was fun, then a lot more would be a lot more fun. So true. Youth is wasted on the young. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Next question from Jason Matthew. In recent years, there have been many scandals in the supplement industry, mislabeling, protein spiking, etc. I've come across a brand that has full transparency when it comes to its contents. They go so far as to include the amount of sucralose they put in their protein powders. My question is, why aren't there more brands like this that are as transparent as these supplements? Because there is no governing body that's strong enough in the industry that really buckles down on the comings and goings of these supplement companies. That's the problem. So they can get away with the shit that he's talking about, for the most part. Every once in a while, there might be a class action suit, and then they have to straighten up for a little bit, but it's just not like the FDA. It's not like the, the drugs that have to undergo like the double-blind placebo, 10 different tests, and you know, 
Do you think it back. should be? Yes. <laughs> yes. And I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, red yeast rice puts people in the hospital with with uh, kidney issues, pissing blood. What is that supposed to do? Why are people taking it's it? Supposed to be, it's supposed to act like a statin. It's supposed to do what statin drugs do, do and lower your cholesterol, which it can do. However, certain batches of the actual original uh, root or whatever the fuck it, it is, the the the, uh, the red the yeast. Mm-hmm ferments in a bad way and ends up in the bottle and causes kidney breakdown. And I know this because it happened to me. And I was in the hospital for a day and a half with CK levels that were 30 times what they were supposed to be. They couldn't figure out what was going on until I said, well, yeah, I do take uh, some supplements. I take red yeast rice. And they're like, yeah, red yeast rice. So now if there was, if there was some governing body that looked – and made sure that none of the batches were fermented the way that would cause these down. You know, it's not going to be – every once in a while, something gets out there anyway. Like there's a there's some tainted batch of something, no matter how closely you look at it. But the supplement industry is ridiculous. They it can is. sell anything. They can sell fucking anything, put a label on it, and and put it on the market. It can do nothing. And they can say it does something, or worst case scenario, it could be harmful. And they say it's not. In fact, quick story, quick story, a woman who signed up with me the other day. A woman who signed up with me the other day, and I will not use names, took a supplement, it was manufactured by a company, um, and it had a certain um, ingredient in it that would react with something else in a certain person's system that had the predisposition for this, and it would blow their liver out. Oh. So this poor woman took this fat burner, oh, no. ended up needing a liver transplant. That's horrible. Yep, she told me the whole story. Shit. She's not the only one. There was another woman in New York the same thing happened to. The good news is that this one woman that I, that's my client ended up with a 17-year-old donor liver, which is great. <laughs> and she's in her 40s, so she got a 17. But the other woman in New York got like an 80-year-old's liver. Uh, all raggedy the same, around the edges. Same supplement, by the way. That's a supplement that you could just order online, take, and lose your liver. Well, how do you protect yourself from this sort of thing? I have no idea. Oh, oh not a good you are. I guess to, I guess you got to Google everything and do your research. But then oh, that, that's going to work either because research is sometimes funded by the uh, people who have special interests. Right. So it's hard. Science. Science. By the won. way, Jason, at the end of his question, adds, also, I hope Dave's knee is getting better. Oh, that's really sweet. Jason Treat. Matthew. Steve Powell asks, what is Dave's opinion on the ketogenic diet? Okay. First uh, of all, maybe there's a few people that don't know. Can you tell us what the ketogenic diet is? Ketogenic diet is no starchy carbohydrates and forcing your body to run off a, an alternate fuel source, ketone bodies and, and stored body fat exclusively. Your body's not going to use uh, glycogen or glucose for fuel. Okay. So there's a period of time where you you know about three days or so where your body goes through withdrawal, then you end up in ketosis where your body's perfectly running off of these other um, substrates for fuel. For fuel, um, I think like any other diet, it has its place. It really does. I like to use the ketogenic diet, um, for instance, in a situation where I have a, a bulking client who's been taking in like six hundred or seven hundred grams of carbs every day for months. Um, and needs to resensitize their their system to carbohydrates because you become to a point where your body starts to become desensitized and the insulin release over time hitting those cells and being uptaken you, you wear the whole mechanism out so if you put that person on a keto diet for say a week it resenses their entire system to carbohydrates so that when you put them back in their bodies uh, respond and they'll go through another weight gain cycle that's one way to use it. 
Another way to use it is for weight loss. It's great for weight loss, but I don't like using it indefinitely. I like using it um, in a way that's called carb cycling. So you'll do like three, four, five days of keto, and then just reintroduce some carbs on the fifth or sixth day, just to keep the body used to the idea of carbohydrates and glucose and running on glucose, it doesn't forget. Right. Um, during those three, four, five, six days of keto, you'll lose a lot of water weight and you'll lose some fat, but then you'll train your body again not to lose the affinity for carbs. Um, so that's the way I, that's the most common way I use it. It's really, really good for diabe- diabetics whose um, carbohydrate metabolism really sucks. So they want to emphasize more dietary fats for fuel and proteins. So for them, you know, it's a great way to, to live if they can live that way. Of course, it's limiting because you're, you're cutting out one third of your, your life's choices out there in the real world, which can be difficult, but I know plenty of people who navigate around that at restaurants and do just fine. Okay, sounds good. Our friend JP Terranova asks, does Dave, oh, you, you answered this on, on Facebook already, but I'll just ask you anyway, so we can hear the vitriol, hear your top of your head blow off. Does Dave believe in a cheat meal the night before a contest to fill out? I absolutely do. I totally and firmly believe in a big junk fattening fucking salty cheat meal the night before you step on stage. If you're my competitor, <laughs> I definitely believe in it for you. If you're going against me the next day, you fucking idiot. <laughs> well, Honestly, doesn't eating like fatty, greasy, carbon stuff fill you out? Doesn't that work? Let's start, let's start with this. Let's start with the fact that I've never seen someone on stage ever who I'm like, mm, damn, if only they were more filled out, they would have won this show. That doesn't fucking happen. Someone wants to be more filled out because they feel fucking bigger when they feel filled out. So that's something that's in their brain that they want to feel. They want to feel like they're constantly pumped like they do normally when they're not in prep. They want their fitted shirts to feel tight, which they don't anymore. So they want to, quote unquote, fill out. The reality is that when you're in contest shape and you're ready to win a show, you're not filled the fuck out. (laughs) You're depleted. You have no water on you. Your skin is as thin as cellophane. You feel small. Your pump might be a little lagging, um, but you're going to look 3D on stage. Well, what is that? Wait, what is that feeling of filling out? Is that water? It's water and carbohydrates. It's basically loading up with um, carbohydrates and having those those carbs go into the cells, the muscle cell, the glycogen and restoring and filling out the muscle cells with water uh, the salt goes in there and it and it attracts the water to the cells and of course it can and will volumize your muscle cells but at the same time it's going to shuttle fluid and fat within hours right into your what i call sweet spots so if you just lost your lower bot lower kidney fat a week prior to your show it finally went away you know what i'm talking about like right at yeah. the lower there, there's little blobs. Yes. Okay. They were the last thing to leave my body when I did a show. I'd swear I'd be a, I'd be 10 days out and still have them, and they'd be gone the day of the show. If you junk feed yourself the night before a show, yes, could you get some more muscle fullness out of it? Yes, but I tell you this, without with absolute certainty, some of that fluid, some of that fat will go to your sweet spots. In other words, it's going to go right to your lower back and you'll walk on stage with your lower back fat again the next day. <laughs> so don't do that. Refrain from that feeling of, of, of having to do that. Feel small but tight and, and dry when you go on stage. If you have to fill out a little bit or carb up, do it with foods that you're already your body's used to. Carb sources that your body has dieted on the entire time. You don't introduce a fucking white roll and a hamburger with onions and lettuce and tomato and a fucking French fry the night before a show. Your body hasn't seen that shit in six months. Do you think that people are accepting the erroneous theory that it fills you out 
because they just can't wait to get to that cheat meal on the other side of the contest? Well, that's the thing, too, and they justify it. And, and unfortunately, they have coaches that are telling them to do it. I saw a whole bunch of girls backstage when, when, when I turned my girl pro in bikini. Um, every other girl, she was like, why? Dave, why are all the girls eating all those donuts? You know how they had donuts backstage? Yeah. I said, well, their, their coaches are telling them to do that. They think the sugar is going to bring out their veins. A, bikini girls don't need veins. <laughs> B, they think it's going to fill their muscles out. Bikini girls don't need full muscles. They need to look like a little waif. They are, as you watch them, Michelle, as we watch them, they are right now losing to you. And she got so excited. She goes, that's great. I don't need a donut. I said, you don't need a donut. You need that first place trophy. And she won and turned pro. Suddenly her excitement about what was about to happen shoved Ooh, that donut so I far see. down her list of priorities. Mm-hmm. Exactly that. So it's it's sometimes the coaches. You know, I've seen, I see coaches carving up bikini girls all the time. Like, why are you carving up a girl whose waist needs to look like she's going to snap in half. Why would you do that? All it's going to do is blow her belly. Yeah. Let her eat after the fucking show. I saw a post on Facebook the other day from a competitor who was just starting up her prep for a show probably weeks or months away. And she goes, I'm three days into this prep and already all I can think about is peanut butter. Oh, you're done. I thought to myself, what kind of a mindset is that? Maybe you shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, I think she definitely shouldn't be doing that. And then if you think about it, if peanut butter is that important three days in, how important is peanut butter going to be three weeks in, three months in? It's going to be the only thing she fucking thinks about until she eats a case of it. <laughs> Just seems like a bad mindset. It's an awful mindset. <laughs> it's very prevalent. Very prevalent. People who can put the results as more important than the food they're missing, it's really rare. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's an interesting question. From Chris Andrade or Andrade, I, you know, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but Chris and I are good friends on Facebook. Chris, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. What are Dave's thoughts on the success of pro bodybuilders joining the Camel Crew in Kuwait? What is the reason behind all this success? Is it just an anabolic chicken and egg? Would Dave ever have gone there in his career? <clears throat> it's a perfect storm over there. They have everything they need. They have the coaching. They have the drugs. They have unlimited amount of, of pharma-grade drugs. And that really is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, they're not going to work unless the person's working their ass off. And that's where the training comes in. Like I said, it's the perfect, it's the perfect storm. It's like if you remember Frank Zane retired from – competition in 79 or 80, whatever it was, and he opened up Zane Haven, which was a great fucking idea at the time, I thought. He had his um, this huge ranch in, in uh, Arizona, and he would bring guests there who would stay there for a week, and he would teach them, basically show them, this is what the bodybuilding lifestyle looks like. He'd train them, he'd make them go to failure, do drop set, this is how you should be training. If you're not, this is what it looks like. Um, making their meals, making them eat every couple of hours. If you're not eating like this, well, this is the reason you don't look the way you do. And like putting the food in front of them and making sure that they eat them and just educating them, this is what the bodybuilding lifestyle looks like. So I do believe that that's what's happening there. Whatever happened to that? That sounds great. I don't know, I think it still exists actually, Zane Haven. Okay. I have to look it up, but it started I think in the uh, 80s. So his, if, he, if he's still doing it, <laughs> He's probably sick and tired of it. <laughs> but what, what a great concept. Um, you know, it's becoming harder and harder to find good gear here in the U.S., and, and Kuwait has some good stuff. Um, and, and think about it. It's the cream of the crop who are going over there. It's the guys who already have the genetics and the work ethic. And like I said, it's the perfect storm. And, yes, I would have gone over there had I had the means to do it in my 20s and 30s. I would have done anything, anything to look like Kevin LeVron and Flex Wheeler back then. Yeah, I know. Uh, one more question from Chris. This will wrap up our Q&A segments for this time. T took us three episodes to get them all done. But another one from Chris. Last question of the night. To train with a belt or not? I see a lot of the pros who seem to wear one even when doing isolation exercises. Yeah, that's a mistake. 
Uh, I'm not saying I don't believe in ever wearing a belt. If you're a power lifter and you're doing a one rep max <clears throat> where you just don't want your spine to explode and have discs fly all over the room, you're putting a thousand pounds on your back, you might want to have some compression around your waist. But wearing it to every workout, doing rows and seated rows and, and pull-ups and chins and uh, overhead presses and your curls and every, that while wearing a belt all the time, I think just trains the muscles to depend on exogenous and external pressure. And I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should take that thing off and only use it for maximum or submaximal reps overhead or where you're going to have a lot of spinal pressure, uh, especially in the lower back. Do you use, have you used a belt uh, for certain things throughout your career? The last time I touched a belt and actually touched it, like with my thing, touched a belt, I was 19. <clears throat> oh, seriously? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's the answer to that then. Uh, I want to thank everybody for giving us the questions. You know, maybe in a couple weeks or a couple months or so, I'm going to open it up again for another Q&A because this turned out really good. And I think we got some good questions from everyone. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Dave, for participating. Absolutely. Dogs are amazing creatures. Bred for centuries from wolves to be our companions and helpers, they nevertheless are still wired for certain distinctive pack behaviors that sometimes we may misinterpret. When your dog does something wrong, they're smart and they know it. I mean, it's obvious. And we tend to think of their sort of supplicating behavior after being bad as similar to human guilt. But Ben Gilbert has a darker, somewhat sadder explanation that may cause you to be kinder to your dog when it poops in the hall. That guilty look that your dog is giving you isn't actually guilt. They're scared. From IFLScience.com Written by Ben Gilbert and posted February 20th, 2017. Every dog owner knows the telltale look of a dog who did something it wasn't supposed to do. Maybe she pooped on the floor. Maybe she chewed through your favorite couch cushion or the carpet on the stairs. You know she did something she shouldn't have done, and seemingly she does too. Since you're a human being, you see that look and ascribe a common human emotion to it. Guilt. All the logic lines up. Your dog was left alone, did something they weren't supposed to do, that they know better than to do, and when they're called on it, their face says it all. Perhaps you're already saying, no, bad dog, bad dog, or some variation thereof. The truth is, despite your logical summation, the dog isn't feeling guilt. Instead, they're expressing a much more common, less complex emotion, fear. Don't just take my word for it. That assertion is based on a 2009 study conducted by dog cognition scientist Dr. Alexander Horowitz, author of 2009's Inside of a Dog, What Dogs See, Smell, and Know, and 2016's Being a Dog, Following the Dog into a World of Smell. Dr. Horowitz's 2009 study, Disambiguating the Guilty Look, Salient Prompts to a Familiar Dog Behavior, specifically focuses on the concept of how humans interpret dog emotions through the scope of human emotion. More simply, humans tend to misattribute dog emotions based on human emotions. The guilty look is a prime example of this. Quote, I look at a dog showing the guilty look, and it feels guilty to me. It does. We're kind of wired to see it this way, so it's nobody's fault, Dr. Horowitz told me in a recent interview. The look is distinct. The dog cowers, showing the whites of its eyes while looking up at you. Maybe it pins its ears back to its head, yawns, or licks the air. These are all characteristic signs of fear in a dog, signs that we humans tend to misattribute as guilt. Horowitz's 2009 study is a clear demonstration of how humans tend to anthropomorphize their dogs. Here's how the study went, and what it revealed based on the abstract. 
Trials varied the opportunity for dogs to disobey an owner's command to not eat a desirable treat while the owner was out of the room, and varied the owner's knowledge of what their dogs did in their absence. The results revealed no difference in behaviors associated with the guilty look. By contrast, more such behaviors were seen in trials when owners scolded their dogs. The effect of scolding was more pronounced when the dogs were obedient, not disobedient. To put that more succinctly, the study found that dogs demonstrating a guilty look were actually demonstrating fear of scolding, based on owner cues, rather than guilt, which was an appreciation of a misdeed. I want to just stop here and clarify something because I don't think the writer made it as clear as he could have. At least it took me a couple of times reading it to understand that the study fooled the owners of the dogs into thinking that the dogs had disobeyed them some of the time, causing them to reprimand the dogs. And, and that reprimand caused as much of a guilty look in the dogs as when the dogs actually did the thing. So it didn't matter whether the dogs had done or hadn't done the deed. It was the demeanor of their owner hollering at them, which caused the so-called guilty look. I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence if you understood that from the abstract, but since it took me a couple times to read it, and I think it's also pivotal in understanding what they're saying here, I wanted to try to clarify that for you. So do dogs experience guilt? Well, maybe, maybe not. Quote, it seems unlikely that they have the same types of thinking about thinking that we do because of their really different brains. But in most ways, dogs' brains are more similar to ours than dissimilar, Dr. Horowitz told me. That first bit is especially important. The concept of thinking about thinking, sometimes known as executive function, because it means dogs aren't likely to reflect on their past actions and decide they've done something wrong. Quote, There is some work showing that some animals are planning for the future and remember specific episodes in the past, Horowitz said. Quote, With dogs, there's not as much evidence yet, which isn't to say that they don't, but it's to say that it's really hard to design experiments around it. End quote. Dogs have memories, of course, but thinking about those memories in the same way human memories work is likely wrong. Quote, they're not remembering it in language, Horowitz said. They don't talk about it. Do they think about it when they're lying on the couch waiting for you to get home? We don't know. We would love to know that, but we don't know. End quote. Lacking the scientific studies to explain how dogs experience emotion and memory, we instead turn to our own anthropomorphisms. Quote, when you adopted your dog, and suddenly you're living with a dog, within a week we have opinions about the dog's personality, what they're like, and what they're thinking. It's a way to try to predict what's going to happen next with an organism that we don't really know, Horowitz said. So we use the language of human explanation, and we just put it on the dog. End quote. Well, that is interesting, but I feel like guilt and being scared are so close as to be almost indistinguishable. I mean, they both seem to me to be intertwined in a way. So I don't know how helpful it is to even make this distinction. I'm more of a cat person myself, and cats don't give a shit about guilt, so I don't have much to go on, and that's why this article kind of fascinated me. So maybe you dog owners can tell me if this has changed the way you see your pet and if you'll treat your dog differently in the future when it does something bad. Let me know in the comments. Thanks for listening to Voices of Bodybuilding. Just a reminder that you can send me articles to be considered for this podcast at mike at mikepulsanella.com. They can be articles you find or pieces you write yourself. So till next time, stay active and stay healthy. The views expressed in the articles are obviously the opinions of the writers and not me. I make no claims for the veracity of the information presented, so use your head and check these things out for yourself before trying anything you hear about on VOB.